Hello Internet and welcome to the Collective Arcana. We are a channel all about tabletop gaming and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Mwangi Expanse. First and foremost, let me say I'm very sorry for the long delay between videos. Uh, we will try to get them coming out a little bit more rapidly in the future, so we appreciate your patience and thanks for sticking around. So the Mwanga Expanse is the latest book in the Pathfinder Lost Omen series. These are a little less crunchy and mechanics focused books than what they would consider core rule books. Uh, they are much more devoted to Galarian setting. Uh, as we have seen with the Lost Omens Ancestry Guide and several of the other books, that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of great content for people who are just looking to add more, you know, ancestries and uh, archetypes and things like that. We even got a witch patron in uh, Lost Omens Legends. Uh, so, you know, there is definitely some stuff there if you are just looking to add more crunch to your game, more, more mechanics and options for your players. But there's also a whole lot of great lore. And as a homebrewer, as somebody who doesn't really play so much in Galarian, uh, but I do like a lot of things about the setting, um, it's really nice for me to get this deep dive. Uh, and it's for a setting that is not part of the traditional uh, RPG landscape of European medieval fantasy. Uh, this is going to take you to a whole new section of the world uh, from what you might imagine to be the typical. And that's great and that's wonderful. As somebody who homebrews, this is still going to be an excellent tool for me to flesh out those parts of my world that are also not based on European-centric uh, mythology and stuff. So first things first, this is a big book. Uh, you can compare it to here to, uh, this is uh, Gods and Omens, which is pretty standard. Uh, it's definitely a very much larger book. Uh, it's also a very different cover design. Uh, you know, Gods and Omens, of course, famously a very... Uh, distinct cover on its own, definitely bucking the format, but just in terms of the way that the art uh, actually wraps around here uh, and is even on the spine, so that's different. Uh, but the size is really what we want to talk about. So far, most of the Lost Omens books, because they're not these big giant rule books designed to just give players more options, more options, more options, have usually been under 200 pages. Uh, the uh, Or right around 200 pages. The uh, Lost Omens Ancestry Guide had quite a bit of content, and this one does as well. This one is coming in at over 300 pages. Not a lot over, but still over 300 pages. Now that tells us a couple of things. It tells us, A, there's a lot in here, and of course there is. It also tells us that Paizo took this seriously. Uh, you know, they could have very easily given us something bare bones to work with, but this is a complete, I want to say that, this is a complete setting guide in and of itself. You could treat the Mwangi Expanse with this book. You could run this as if this was the entirety of Galarian. This was your entire campaign setting. That's how in-depth it goes with the peoples and the cultures and the myths and the legends and the history and places of interest, all that. It is absolutely crammed full with cool stuff. The reason for that is because Paizo took this really seriously. This is something that... Uh, we really don't get a lot of from the major publishers. Now, there are a lot of great indie uh, companies out there that are publishing some very non-traditional, and that's so weird to say, and it's such a, it doesn't feel right to say non-traditional because it's only traditional because that's sort of where we focused it. But uh, the point is that while there's a lot out there to show things that are non-medieval uh, European centric, uh, this is really the first time that a big major publisher has really dived into something like that. Uh, and that means that they're bringing all the polish, all the awesome stuff that they normally bring to it, but they also got a lot of uh, voices from those uh, communities and related to those cultures and brought them together to make something that is really, really unique. And I don't just mean that in terms of this Lost Omens line. I mean that in terms of, you know, Paizo, Wizards of the Coast, anything like that. This is a really groundbreaking book. So this jumps in, it covers uh, everything from world history going back thousands of years into the different ages of Galarian's past, uh, and the part that this campaign setting, the Mwangi Expanse, this area of Galarian played, uh, as well as, you know, how it dealt with people, you know, coming to it, not just what was going on in it, but, you know, as, as uh, people came into it, and how that shook out, uh, and just thousands and thousands of years of lore history. 
Beyond that, it goes into current events. It goes into, you know, how the current uh, nations and cultures within the Mwangi Expanse got shaped by that history and where they are now. Uh, it covers their religions, the different uh, types of ancestries and, uh, again, like just cultures that will be there, uh, as well as, you know, all the things that could be sort of bubbling up to the surface for future plot hooks. I'm not exaggerating when I say that you could play in the with just the material in this book for years and years and years and come away with diverse settings within this setting. That's how big it is and how much it covers uh, and all sorts of unique stories. Any kind of story you want to tell, it could exist just within the Wonga Expanse. That's, again, just really crazy how much they put in here. And because Paizo hired the best people to illuminate and tell these types of stories for these types of cultures, that means that we're getting something that uh, we haven't seen. We're getting voices that unfortunately in this hobby don't always get blasted out the loudest. They don't get the attention that they deserve. And uh, this is really showing us uh, what it can look like when you give the resources of a big company like Paizo to these people who are eager to uh, you know, share these cultures and these ideas that are, again, just not the typical, and how much richer we can come away because of that. And that's not to say that this is just built on how it's different from Tolkien. I mean, there's definitely some Tolkien uh, essences. I mean, you know, the guy was telling these very, uh, uh, very specific stories, but with these classical tropes, right? So, so you know, a lot of that kind of stuff is still in here, but there's also a lot of just uniqueness. Not how different it is, but just how unique it is. And that's a very subtle but very important distinction. So let's actually dive in and, and sort of cover what is inside the covers here. Uh, it starts off with just a sort of basic overview of where the Expanse is and what the Expanse is and some generalizations. It also has some good GM notes uh, to tell you, you know, how you might want to best present this book. Uh, one of the phrases they use is exciting, not exotic. Uh, and it's really important to them and to the, to the people who made this to say that, you know, you want to approach this not as look at this strange land that we're in, but approach it as this is someone's home and we're just, you know, either visiting or we're embodying people who it is our home, you know, when we're playing those characters. So, uh, you know, it, I think that's a really great thing because it would be really easy to just treat this as these types of settings have been before, of just, you know, oh, everything is strange and, and you can't understand it. It's so foreign and bizarre. But no, this is told very much from the perspective of people from the Wange Expanse. And so that's going to just give a whole new perspective on how you can build characters and run campaigns in that viewing, you know, it as its own thing rather than, again, as just another. From there, it goes, as I said, into a brief-ish history of the, the area, going back quite a ways. This can come off a little bit dry. Uh, if you're not like me, if you didn't love, you know, just reading ahead in your history books like a weirdo, uh, <laughs> in your history class, whatever you could, uh, this is going to come off as pretty dry, um, you know, if this isn't your sort of thing. Uh, but it also could definitely be a sort of thing, and it's not something you should ignore. I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had here. This is not, you know, your college civics or, you know, this class like that where, you know, they're just skipping just into boring government and then this pass and this pass. No, this is not that that's not important stuff and you should pay attention to, to that. I didn't mean to apply that. I just meant that uh, what this is doing is, you know, sort of the, the highlights, the most exciting parts of the history, the uh, the high notes and the low notes, of course, as well. Uh, you know, so you can really just get a picture of it. Uh, so don't skip it, even though, you know, for some of you it might seem a little dry. There's a lot of exciting stuff there. Once we have the context, it jumps into about 100 pages of the different types of people you might meet in the Mwangi Expanse, whether that is humans, dwarves, elves, uh, you know, the different heritages and subcultures that live within uh, uh, the Mwangi Expanse of the ancestries that we're familiar with. But then it also jumps into some that we're not familiar with, some that are specifically new, uh, at least for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, to this book, uh, and dives into where they fit in and how, how they may, may fit in. And one thing that it does that's very interesting is it states directly that while, uh, you know, elves, goblins, half-elves, half-orcs, gnomes, halflings, and humans would be the common ancestries in the core rulebook, if you're playing in the Mwangi Expanse, you as a GM may want to treat other ancestries as common and vice versa. So, you know, it really gives you the idea that you might want to change what the standards are for that campaign setting. Now, this is, of course, one of the big draws as a non-Galarian player 
to this book is it comes with six brand new ancestries. We get the Anadi, which are cute little spiders. Um, I say little, they're five feet. That's probably too big for some people. Um, but they are very cute. They're based usually seems like on jumping spiders, which are these sort of big guys. If, if any bug is cute, if bugs aren't cute to you at all, I understand. But if any bug is cute, a jumping spider is cute. But, they, but it's funny because even the Anadi know that uh, people were weirded out by spiders. So uh, they have the ability to take a human form to not scare people because they don't want to be just, you know, giving people heart attacks. They want to say, hey, you know, hi, we're okay. <laughs> Ease them into the spider face, you know, that kind of thing. The Anadi are pretty cool because, uh, you know, they can shift to human or spider form. They get different capabilities within each form. Um, and that's... Uh, you know, in addition to a sort of hybrid form that they can take, which I think we've seen before in a bestiary. Um, but just a lot of room to play there, and it's, it's, I can't, I'm going to say it again, it's a spider. It's not a spider person, although they do have that hybrid form feet. They're just big spiders, <laughs> and that's so fun. <laughs> Next we have the Kanrasu. Now the Kanrasu are... Uh, I don't believe we've had any depiction of them before in uh, Pathfinder or uh, anything, since I think they're unique to that setting, uh, as Meyer's saying. I'm sure there could be some sort of mythological basis for them, but to my knowledge, uh, they're very weird and unique, and they're their own thing. They are essentially these aeons, these like sort of alien crystal entities that <laughs> um, uh, got stranded somehow uh, on uh, Galarian, and decided to build themselves bodies out of vines and plant matter, uh, these sort of armored bodies. They have the option to actually have an armored body. They're sort of these constructs that aren't quite constructs. Uh, they're, so they're somewhere between a construct and a leshy, and also just a weird alien crystal. They're very weird, and they're very uh, unique to uh, the setting of Galarian and the Moongi Expanse specifically. We also have gnolls. I love gnolls. Uh, gnolls, um, as most people familiar with fantasy will know, that gnolls are typically these uh, pretty bulky, monstrous hyena people. Um, usually evil. Um, they are, in this, they are presented as more misunderstood. They certainly have some strange, uh, uh, maybe uh, undesirable for some people tendencies, uh, like cannibalism, but for them, cannibalism is a sign of honor and respect. It's not, you know, just ravenous, eat anything that is around. Uh, it's a much more ceremonial thing for them, and it's part of their culture, and it's presented that way. And as somebody who really likes gnolls, um, I am really excited to have official rules for gnolls and allow my players to play them, because more gnolls is more fun. Next, we have Goloma. Now, the Goloma are another very unique thing, I believe, created by Paizo, specifically for this book. I don't think there have been, if there have been res, res, uh, if there have been references to them before, I'm not aware of them, but that's not terribly surprising because I am not super familiar with Galarian. Uh, the Galoma are these monster people. They look terrifying, and they play into that. They, you know, wear these complicated masks, and they, uh, you know, they have, they have clawed hands, and they really like that. But they're actually super peaceful and sort of cowardly. So, whereas the Anadi are these spiders who are like, oh, you know, we like people and we want to, you know, befriend to everyone, so we're going to put on these human faces to not scare people with our spider bodies. The Goloma are like, well, we don't like anybody. We're afraid everyone's going to try to kill us, so we're going to look as scary as possible. Uh, it's a fun little dichotomy that we got both of those in the same book, and seeing how those two ancestries and cultures approach their interactions. Uh, it's, it's really fun. It's a weird, weird looking thing, but a pretty cool thing. Uh, and as a home brewer, it's one of those that are very, uh, I'm very curious how I'm going to end up fitting them into my home world, because I, uh, my homebrew world, because I definitely like them. And I, one of the things I don't do is tell my players, no, you can't play that thing. So I've got to think of a place for these really weird looking, they have all sorts of eyes on their heads. They're weird. Next, we come to the Gripply. Gripply are frog people, and that's really cute as well. Um, they are these sort of natural, like, ranger type of woodsy folk. You know, they're good at climbing trees and jumping around like you would expect frogs to be good at. Uh, and they are, you know, really just these sort of nature-infused 
uh, people and they're frogs. They get cool abilities with their tongues um, and, of course, you know, jumping and climbing, things that you would expect. Uh, super cute. I don't know what else to say. I think they, they, they also get some, uh, some options for, like, natural poisons and things like that. Uh, you know, like rainforest frogs tend to have. And, uh, again, just really excited to fit these into my homebrew world, unlike the Colombo, which are, again, very strange. I think I've got an idea where to put frog people. So I'm okay there. Finally, we have the Shisk. Now, the Shisk are, uh, in addition to being sort of a fun word to say, Shisk, they are uh, humanoids that look very human, uh, except that they have these feather-like uh, quills coming out of their bodies. They seem to be localized, typically, to the, the head, the back, the shoulders, uh, the arms. Um, but yes, they have these like porcupine-esque quills. They tend to live underground. They're very inquisitive. They like to seem like they make pretty good uh, archaeologists and uh, things like that. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. I wonder, you know, if the burrowing, the hedgehog thing is sort of related to the spines, you know, which came first sort of thing. But uh, I'm really not sure I'm going to fit these in. Uh, but they're definitely cool and unique and definitely something that... Uh, goes to show how weird things get in the Milwaukee Expanse. We also, uh, part of the reason why I have Gods and Magic here, is because we get full coverage, full uh, one pages on 12 deities for the Milwaukee Expanse. Now one of them, uh, Grandmother Spider, did appear in uh, Gods and Magic, and that information is recreated. Same here, so you don't have to worry about any contradictions there. Um, you know, there is a little more context and things like that, which are great uh, for, you know, specifics of how, how it fits in lore-wise to this to the sub-setting within the setting. I looked up several of them to see uh, if they appear in the back of the Gods of Magic, and some of them do. Most, uh, most I did not see, although the way that that's grouped, I definitely could have missed one. There's a lot of gods in Gods of the Magic. Um, but the ones that I checked seem to line up. One of them, though, did not. Walkina uh, is a god that changed sort of abruptly from gods and magic to this. Um, I will not spoil it too much, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, the uh, he sort of came out of retirement, and that sort of changed a little bit about him. In addition to those, there's at least one more. I only noticed one. There could have been another, uh, and that is, let me read it here, Kutumi the goddess of fireflies, and she's not as warm and fuzzy as she sounds, but, uh, uh, yeah, so there is just, that's just a little aside uh, in the book as well, so a secret little 13th god, which I guess since Grandmother Spider already got, like, the full one page, or Grandmother Spider already got the full one page, I guess, a, you know, kind of nice that we got a 13th so that we could say for sure, yeah, 13 gods are featured, or 12 gods are featured in this book. Next comes loads and loads, uh, about 140 pages worth of... Uh, places and locations, uh, points of interest, uh, yeah, and these are all important places in the Mwanga Expanse, so if you're reading through and you're just trying to, you know, learn uh, the lay of the land, great. If you're like me, every single page of this section has at least one, like, entire adventure just laid out there ready for you to run as a GM. I don't mean that it's in a, like, you know, fully written out adventure module with everything that you need to run it but it's like uh you know oh hey in this place there's these temples to this ancient culture and sometimes this happens and <laughs> and there's just a whole lot of stuff like that and these are just things that as a gm you read and you go oh yeah i should do that oh man that'll be really cool oh look that's a one shot and you just go through and through and through uh it's a just an incredible resource if you ever as a gm just, you know, gone through Reddit or forums or, you know, just general Google searches saying, you know, what's some fun one-shot ideas, uh, you know, or just little adventures that you can slot into uh, your game that you have going. You have that. <laughs> you have 140 pages of that. Then it also does a deep dive on eight of the largest uh, settlements within the Mwangi Expanse. Uh, it's about 100 pages worth to cover eight settlements, so... Uh, quick math says that's, I don't know, a little over 10 pages each. So uh, plenty, plenty there to know, you know, what type of economy it has, trade, what kind of people live there, what kind of problems they're having, what the government is like, or what the surrounding areas are like. Just, you know, if you're playing a party set in this town, this is what you can expect to deal with. Um, and that's great as a GM because, again, just 
whole campaigns just from one of these settlements. Uh, there have been adventure paths and even setting books that have had a lot less detail in them, covering entire settings uh, for what the Mwanga Expanse is giving you for just this piece of Galarian. Finally, we get 17 pages of bestiary. Uh, that does amount to about 17 monsters. That's usually about a monster page. Um, there may be some variation with, uh, you know, multiple different, like, subtypes of the same creature. Uh, like Anadi, I think there's three Anadi spread over two pages. But, you know, about 20, 20 monsters. These are typically very thematic and uh, definitely unique uh, and, you know, great things that you could just drop into any campaign setting, but they're really nice to have because they're so setting specific. Whew, that is a lot. It's a big book, like I said. Uh, and the great thing is, as I said at the top, you can just drop this into your personal setting. You can, of course, run in the Moangi Expanse in Galarian and have everything that you need, or you can just drag and drop these places, these NPCs, uh, these locations, these historic moments into your own campaign and have all the details that you need there. And for that reason, it's just a great boon to homebrewers like me. Let's face it, folks. Every campaign needs a Gorilla King and a River of Blood, right? I, I think so. Even as somebody who's loved fantasy their entire life and, you know, has played tabletop RPGs and video games, I'm always craving something that is non-European centric. I feel like uh, you know, whether, however true that may or may not be, I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on how to build a European-inspired uh, medieval fantasy setting. Um, and I've done a whole lot of work to try to cover other areas, other, you know, cultures and stuff like that in my world. Not, of course, porting over, but, uh, you know, just places inspired by that. Uh, but it's hard. It's really hard to do a good job with that without just falling back on, oh, it's like this thing, but it's this thing. Uh, so to have this campaign setting that is giving me, uh, you know, this unique perspective, I, I hope we get this for all of the uh, different regions in Galarian. I think that uh, this type of book where they take people, uh, you know, who can best tell those stories, people that can relate to the cultures that are being represented there, and allowing them to uh, just sort of Go crazy with it. Again, 300 pages in a, in a uh, series that very typically is only around 200 pages. And just telling them, you know, hey, you know, this is what we're aiming for. Help us make it work. Help us figure out how to tell the types of stories that, you know, people aren't telling enough. And that's great. And I hope we get it for all over Galarian. Again, even though I'm not playing there, you may not be playing there. It's a absolutely uh, just priceless resource for these types of games. On top of all that, the art is fantastic. I mean, just look at this cover, it's beautiful. Um, you know, we try not to use any art that isn't uh, released officially by Paizo on various social media platforms and stuff like that, so I'm not sure how much I'm gonna be able to find that I feel comfortable putting up just because I don't wanna, you know, give away their, their art and their artist's art. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, anything promotional, I view as fair game, hopefully they do too. But, you know, I, it's, it's gorgeous, it's just breathtaking. Uh, there are just so many images in there that are just just striking and, again, are going to inspire entire adventures or five-level adventures for you and your players. All that is to say, go buy this book. Check out the Mwangi Expanse. Um, support this type of book. Support this business model, this this idea of saying, you know, let's let people tell stories that we're not going to get to see from this big of a publisher very often. You want to, when you see stuff like this, you want to reward it. And the best way to do that is to buy it. Whether you're going through uh, Paizo and getting just the PDF, whether you're getting the hardcover, uh, they also typically release the soft cover format books that are generally quite a bit cheaper. Uh, you know, so there's something to fit your price point most likely. And again, if this is something you like, support that, show that you like it with your money. That's the best thing you can do. Um, and hopefully we'll get more and more Pfizer. We'll see how popular it is, what a hit it is, and we'll get more. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you know, hope you're as excited about this as I am. Uh, we've got more coming down the pipe, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the collective. We'll see you next time.